in that beautiful world on high. Oh, I will be there. Oh, I will be there. Welcome to Clinton Church Restoration's online community read of The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. The mission of Clinton Church Restoration is to create an African-American heritage site and cultural center at the historic Clinton AME Zion Church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where W.E.B. Du Bois was born and raised. As a cultural hub inspired by Du Bois' work as a seminal writer, scholar, and activist, this new center will use interpretive exhibits and contemporary programming to explore his complex life and legacy, celebrate the work of this freedom church, and share hidden and untold stories of African-American life in rural New England. Our 14-week community read of The Souls of Black Folk will be moderated by Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, historian, board member, and chair of our Scholars Council. Each week she will be joined by a guest scholar for a presentation of a single chapter of Du Bois's classic text, followed by a discussion with the audience. If you're joining us live, we invite and appreciate your participation. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. For best results, we recommend you have the most recent version of the Zoom app downloaded on your device. Attendees watching via a browser may not have all the interactive features available. To see the full schedule for this community read or to learn more about the project, please visit our website at clintonchurchrestoration.org. Thanks for joining us. With palms of victory, crowns of glory you shall wear In that beautiful world on high Oh, I will be there Oh, I will be there With palms of victory, crowns of glory shall wear in that beautiful world on high. Welcome to our 11th uh, session of the community read of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. We are really pleased to have with us this evening two scholars, Dr. Nadine Witterborn and Dr. Ruby Vega. Dr. Witterborn is an associate professor and mentor at SUNY Empire State College in Schenectady, New York. And Dr. Vega is an associate professor of psychology at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, where she teaches courses in educational psychology and psychological research methods. We are very happy to have you both with us this evening. Thank you, Francis. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Dr. Joan Sneed and Clinton Church Restoration for inviting us to be a part of this important and wonderful series. It is indeed an honor for me to, uh, to be included among such an impressive lineup of scholars. I must also thank Dr. Marinelle Morgan Brown, Professor Emeritus at SUNY Empire State College, who really spawned my interest in and subsequent teaching of the souls of black folk. I have used the text to supplement courses in sociology, political science, and public policy, and in a compulsory course at Empire State College called Educational Planning, where students are invited to reflect on and write about their undergraduate journey and what it means to be an educated person. The Souls of Black Folk has proven to be an effective teaching and a learning resource in all these contexts. So I've chosen to call my, ref my reflection this evening, Du Bois Made Flesh. This is a deliberate play on words to acknowledge that in this, the 11th chapter of The Souls of Black Folk, the reader witnesses a humanizing of W.E.B. Du Bois through his role as father. This is the shortest essay in the book, but it is arguably the one in which Du Bois most reveals his vulnerability and humanness. Up to this point in the text, we have been exposed to Dr. Du Bois's intellectual acuity through the lens of history, political science, 
sociology, philosophy, religion, and economics, all interwoven somewhat with a thread of Greek classics. The writing has been mainly in the voice of Du Bois, the professional scholar, which puts some distance between him and the reader. In the last chapters, beginning with this, the 11th, Dr. Du Bois depicts Black folk as more than mere research subjects and draws the reader closer to offer them a glimpse into the quote unquote deeper recesses of Black life. That is, more intimate realities of life within the veil. Dr. Du Bois moves from the analytical unit of the group to the individual to show Black folk not as extraordinary beings, quote, gifted with second sight in this American world, end of quote, but as real human beings with the capacity to feel and respond to real human experiences, not the least of which are death, grief, and loss. Are you seeing the slides? Thank you. Of the passing of the firstborn posits a counter narrative to the lie that is told of black people's superhuman capacity to bear physical, mental, and emotional pain. It seems to me too that in keeping with his self-appointed role as representative of black folk, Dr. Du Bois is using a personal misfortune to elicit sympathy for the collective and raise a lamentation of his people. In this chapter, we are forced to contend with a black father's range of emotions on full display. We see Du Bois go from heights of elation to depths of despair, yet all the while encouraging and inspiring with a belief that though weeping may endure for a night, joy cometh in the morning. Next slide, please. The chapter begins with the last verse of Algernon Charles Swinburne's poem, Ithilus. Swinburne was an English poet well known for his Greek style play Atalanta in Caledon. The poem Itilus relays the grief of Aidan, a figure in Greek mythology who cries constantly over the death of her firstborn child, Itilus. According to legend, Itilus is accidentally killed after a plot to kill his cousin goes terribly awry. The Greek gods, taking pity on Aidan, turned her into a nightingale to sing sorrowfully over the death of her child until the end of time. Swinburne's translation of this tragedy into poetry places Aidan the Nightingale in conversation with a swallow. In the last verse of the poem, we hear the voices of three characters. O oh, sister, sister, thy first begotten, the hands that cling and the feet that follow, the voice of the child's blood crying yet, who hath remembered me? Who hath forgotten? Thou hast forgotten, O summer swallow, but the world shall end when I forget. It is the swallow that calls attention to the child asking, who has remembered me? Who has forgotten? And the mother nightingale who reassures that the world shall end when I forget. It should not be lost on us that there's a parallel to be drawn here between the nightingale's disconsolate singing and black folk's soulful utterances in song. The sorrow that black people have had to endure in this life across time and space has been transformed into music of an infinitely beautiful variety. Indeed, no one does the blues, soul, jazz, and spirituals as excellently as Black people, much of which is without question written out of an experience of deep pain, yet music that lives on with a profoundly healing intensity. Next slide, please. The sorrow song for this chapter is, I hope my mother will be there. Du Bois tells us in the chapter, in the last chapter in the text, 
that in the sorrow songs, quote, the slaves spoke to the world, end of quote. This is certainly true with I Hope My Mother Will Be There, in which the enslaved person melodiously communicates the expectancy of being reunited with loved ones in the dwelling place of the afterlife. It is appropriate that Du Bois chooses this song to lead us into his, his experience of living through the passing of his firstborn. Whereas the poem expresses the weeping of a mother never forgetting the death of her child, the sorrow song in traditional call and response style allows a mother to allay any concerns of their child looking to be reunited with them in death. That Du Bois uses this poem and song as the epigraph, epigraph of this chapter is significant for setting the context of the raw human emotions that he will share in the essay. Next slide, please. Thank you. The essay begins, unto you a child is born. These are words adapted from the book of Isaiah in the Hebrew Bible that announced to Dr. Du Bois the birth of his first child, Berghardt Gomer Du Bois. We know that Dr. Du Bois believed in the primacy of scripture. So it's no surprise that he would use this biblical reference interpreted by many as a messianic text to signify how he saw his son, saw in his son, inspiration, promise, and hope for black folk. Although neither the child nor mother is named in the essay, I wanna make a quick comment on naming. The B in WEB stands for Burkhart, which was Dr. Du Bois's mother's last name before marriage. Gomer was Du Bois's wife Nina's last name before marriage. And so I think it is worth noting that the beloved firstborn son was given his mother's and grandmother's pre-marriage names in a way sort of to ensure that those names lived on. Burghardt was born on October 2, 1897 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, during the time when Dr. Du Bois was working in Philadelphia on the Philadelphia Negro. Du Bois had sent Nina to Great Barrington while she was pregnant with the hopes that she would receive better health care there. Upon receiving the news of Burkhardt's birth, Dr. Du Bois admits to simultaneously feeling joy and trepidation about becoming a father, as he imagined how the baby might look and feel. These are real emotions of any first time parent who wonders if they will ever be able to live up to the weighty responsibility of providing for a child while being an exemplary role model in the most worthy ways possible. Surely, parenting is a very humbling experience. We learn of Du Bois's growing love for Burghardt through the love and admiration he had for Nina. In acknowledging the awesome, yet ostensibly near-death experience that is labor and delivery for every woman who has given birth, Du Bois declares, quote, I did not love it then. It seemed a ludicrous thing to love, but her I loved, my girl mother, she whom now I saw unfolding like the glory of the morning, the transfigured woman. Through her, I came to love the wee thing as it grew and waxed strong, as its soul unfolded itself in twitter and cry and half-formed word, and as its eyes caught the gleam and flash of life in the school. The writing about the immeasurably strong bond between Nina and Burkhardt is descriptive and moving and conveys to the reader how deeply love can run between a black mother and her child. Only Nina could tend to Burkhardt. Nina allowed no one but herself to bathe him, dress him and put him to sleep. So close were they, it appeared they had their own language. Du Bois writes, her own life builded and molded itself upon the child. He tinged her every dream and idealized her every effort. She and he together spoke some soft and unknown tongue and in it held communion, end of quote. As for himself, 
Du Bois writes about singing to Burkhardt as a way to escape, albeit momentarily, his own internalized fears and struggles. While bonding with a child and noticing features akin to being of mixed race, Dr. Du Bois admits to becoming unsettled by the fact that Burghardt would not be rid of the vagaries of living in a racist USA, what he refers to as, quote, a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty a lie, end of quote. Next slide, please. Berghardt's golden hair and brown eyes were at once an ominous reminder of the child's ancestry and future life, quote, in the land of the color line. And from the depiction of the family tree, we see that Dr. Du Bois's paternal great-grandfather, one Dr. James, was white, and Nina herself was biracial. By the time Berghardt reached one year of age, Dr. Du Bois and Mrs. Du Bois had relocated to Georgia. There they noted that the soil was strangely red, emblematic of the pervasive, peculiar lived experience of the veil in that state, the Georgia brand of racism, if you will. Nevertheless, W.E.B. Du Bois's hopes and dreams for his son never waned. After all, to be firstborn means not only priority in time, but a certain superiority in privilege and authority. He saw in Burghardt a quote unquote revelation of the divine, heard in his voice, the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil and believed that Burghardt would valiantly carry on the fight of the black ancestors in his own strength. And then one fateful night in the spring of 1899, the 24th of May to be exact. Burghardt fell ill from diphtheria. Diphtheria is an acute, highly contagious bacterial disease that causes inflammation of the mucous membranes, hindering breathing and swallowing, and can cause fatal heart and nerve damage. Despite Dr. Du Bois's status as an esteemed scholar and university professor, he failed to get a doctor to pay a home visit to the child. On the 10th night of Burghardt's illness, W.E.B. and Nina alone watched their only child take its last breath. As Dr. Du Bois relays it, quote, his little soul leapt like a star that travels in the night and left a world of darkness in its train. The day changed a lot, end of quote. Here we hear echoes of Swinburne's poem with a mother saying the day she forgets the passing of her child is the day the world comes to an end. Without a doubt, both parents were devastated. Nina being characterized as the world's most piteous, piteous thing, a childless mother. And in a clear show of human frailty, Du Bois questions death and wonders why such an awful fate should befall him. He eulogizes his son in the essay and tells of the child's innocent, lovable spirit that enlarged humanity and warmed the hearts of all who encountered him. On the day of the burial, as they made their way to the cemetery, white passersby snared at the Du Bois contingency using the N-word. Imagine, even in moments of grief, the false ideology of white supremacy has no chill, no off button, no exceptions made to sympathize with even the most respectable of black families. Bear in mind that this was about a month after the horrendous lynchings of Sam Hose and Lee Strickland in a Georgia town not far from Atlanta. These were highly publicized events that grieved Dr. Du Bois deeply. He asked, Quote, where, O oh God, beneath thy broad blue sky, shall my dark baby rest in peace, where reverence dwells, and goodness, and a freedom that is free, end of quote. So although funeral arrangements were made to bury Burghardt in Atlanta, a last minute decision was taken to inter the baby's body in Great Barrington. 
Dr. Du Bois realized that the last act of dignity that he could do for his dearly departed son was to not yield his remains to the red soil of Georgia. Nina resigned herself to believing that Burkhardt would be happy in that beautiful world on high. And Dr. Du Bois took comfort in knowing that Burghardt would not grow up to suffer the indignities and injustice that awaited him as a black boy alive in the US. In the end, Dr. Du Bois accepts that even as a parent, the human capacity for love and wisdom is limited, perhaps irrelevant, compared to the unending embrace of the all love which Burghardt has come to know. Next slide, please. Dr. Du Bois is consoled by quote unquote, an awful gladness that assures him that although white racism, white supremacy may have no empathy point, it has an end point. Death to Du Bois is a better alternative to life for his firstborn son until they are reunited with each other above the veil. The hope of Sora's song promises that there is a time when grief is healed, the forgotten are remembered, and those who may not matter now will celebrate. Likewise, Du Bois reminds the reader that while sorrow may immure the souls of black folk, surely there shall yet dawn some mighty morning to lift the veil and set the prison free. Thank you. And now Dr. Vega, and now Dr. Vega will give her comments. Hi, hello, thank you, um, Dr. Wedderburn. Thank you so much for those um, very rich um, comments and, and, and context. Um, I come to this chapter anew. Um, I, I don't have the same depth of experience with Du Bois as, as Du Bois's work as um, Dr. Jones Need and Dr. Wedderburn do. Um, so I offer the comments of someone who's new to the work um, or at least new to this chapter. As I read this chapter, I was struck um, by the candor in which Du Bois shared this very deep um, personal and, and devastating loss. Um, and if you could put the slides up, please. As a mother of a child around um, Burkhardt's age, I uh, felt this chapter in a way I had not for the previous chapters, uh, a very raw and, and visceral pain. Um, in the passing of the firstborn, Du Bois speaks both to his loss of a son and the loss of a larger sense of innocence and hope for progress. Uh, I, I quote, I too mused above his little white bed, saw the strength of my own arm stretched onward through the ages, through the newer, newer strength of his, saw the dream of my black fathers stagger a step onward in the wild phantasm of the world, heard in his baby voice, the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil. Without precisely naming it, he describes the weight of the compounding trauma experienced by black folks that consists both of the intergenerational trauma passed down from parent to child and the individual traumas experienced daily by those who exist within the veil. In his son, he saw a tiny black soul that had not yet been burdened and terrorized by the life within the veil. He writes, he knew no color line, poor dear, and the veil, though it shadowed him, had not yet darkened half his son. He loved the white matron. He loved his black nurse. And in his world walked souls alone, uncolored and unclothed. And although at points in the chapter Du Bois expresses a kind of relief in the idea that in death his son might have been spared the traumas of the veil, 
he nonetheless grieves the loss of his son's potential in progressing a future in which Black folks could lift and move beyond the veil. He might have borne his burden more bravely than we, I, and found it lighter to someday, for surely, surely this is not the end. Surely there shall yet dawn some mighty morning to lift the veil and set the prison free. Du Bois's heartache and grief at the loss of his son and his potential are clearly expressed here. And yet, after reading this chapter several times, I wondered why Du Bois chose to share this very specific and, and personal story of grief at this specific point um, in, in Souls. Uh, slide change, please. And so I offer up um, to Dr. Waterburn and, and who has spoken on these questions a little bit, but also uh, Dr. Joan Sneed. Um, what of his own black soul is, is Du Bois offering his audience here, his, his own sorrow, frustration or hope and, and why, why at this point um, in souls, what does he hope to, to achieve? Um, as a non-historian, I wonder mostly about um, what he expected his white audience um, to respond or how to, who would they respond to this? Um, would it be, have a humanizing effect as I, I'm sure he intended it to, to have? Um, and as I read this and, and the relevance of it, um, you know, sits with me even now, um, as a contemporary reader, I wonder what is being asked of us, um, you know, if, if, if Du Bois is reaching through time, what is our specific specific call here. It feels to me that this chapter is also a call to action um, in which he's, he's, he's tapping somebody's humanity and acting, asking them uh, not just to, to be a bystander, but to, to act. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if, if you all had any, any thoughts on that. Thank you, Dr. Vega. It, that was um, really illuminating. And the questions that you have, I think, um, um, are very um, searching. And so if we can go, kind of go back to um, that first question of yours, if you can read it for us, and maybe Dr. Wedderburn can uh, begin, and maybe I will have a few things to say about it. Right. So, so um... Dr. Waterburn, you, you spoke to this a little bit, but, but um, my first uh, response was, you know, what, what is he offering the audience here and, and, and why in this moment is he, is he offering it uh, to, to the reader? What is he hoping that this, this offering of his soul uh, will achieve? Yes, thank you. Thank you to Dr. Vega for sharing your thoughts and reflections and for posing those questions. Um, they are indeed um, worthwhile because, you know, who can read this text in its entirety and not be moved to ask what is it asking of us? So thank you. Thank you for asking that question. I think for me, um, like I said in my introductory remarks, if you will, that um, I think Du Bois made a, a very intentional move from speaking about Black folk as this kind of group of uh, research subjects, right? So up to this point, we've heard him talk about the Black church. We've heard him talk about um, Black men, the training of Black men. Um, our spiritual striving. So at, at, at every stage um, between the beginning of the book and up to now, it seems to me that he uh, really wants to tell the story of Black folk as a people, as a group. But then this chapter shifts that um, focus, if you will, to the individual. The individual, the, 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 the group, the largest as it, as it is, is the family, a family of three. Right, um, so, but his individual pain, his individual experience with this very deep loss. And um, he also tries to bring in 
what it means for a black mother also losing a child. And I think that is why he uh, takes some time to give, uh, pay, give us a little glimpse into what it might have been like for Nina, um, his wife and Burkhardt's mother. Um, and so I believe it really is a deliberate attempt to bring us closer to the person, to the person of the boy. I mean, what more um, revelation or vulnerability can one give but to talk about a very personal event such as the loss of a child? Um, and that's really how I see it. Clearly, there is some, um, and there's no way to write about these experiences in that period without um, recognizing the role that the politics of death, if you will, can possibly play. Right, but um, I really think that he wants to to show to the reader that the souls of black folk are real souls. That um, uh, what 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 more point can you prove about people who have a soul than to show how they feel? And that's that's really what I think this chapter is is doing for us. It's a very poignant chapter in that regard. I agree, uh, Dr. Wedderburn, that it. Um, it is perhaps, I, I always think of chapter two as my favorite chapter in Souls of Black Folk, mainly because it talks about reconstruction, which is my field of study. But this chapter is, it just sticks to your heart, doesn't it? Um, and I think that in, in starting with this chapter, with the shift, and I agree with you, the shift from the group to the individual that we see in succeeding chapters that he continues to do this. Um, and so he's saying to his audience, um, if you didn't get my point when I'm actually looking at statistics, when I'm looking at the social work and talking about the overall impact of racism on a group of people, if you haven't gotten it yet, let me give you something that is so close to my heart. Let me take my heart out and present it to you. You know, let me give this personal story from my own family, because there was one section in the chapter that talks about Burkhart that he was not going to grow up in order to be uh, uh, kind of accused as a young man, and it it brought back memory of when Du Bois talks in his autobiography about uh, uh, this young white girl in his grade school refusing his uh, calling card. I mean, this really, really hurt Du Bois. And he kept in every autobiography talking about this. And he saw that his son Burkhardt was going to live in a different world than the one that he grew up in. And certainly, uh, du Bois' uh, uh, youth in Great Barrington was certainly better than probably 90% or 95% of African-American boys at that point in time. But yet he felt that sting of racism in the same way. And he thought that his son was going to look at it really differently. I think that this gives us a, a Du Bois uh, that is so different from that um, clinician uh, that we, you know, the, some uh, scholars call Du Bois kind of cold in the way that he uses language, the way that he can distance himself from the subject matter. We've talked about this before, how he, he can use the same kind of words that white sociologists, the white political science would use when talking about Black folk but he's using that in a, a kind of professional kind of voice. But when he comes to the personal, he's saying, look at this, look at this child, you know, onto us a child is born. And if nobody has empathy for anybody else, wouldn't it be that we have empathy for the child, you know, in, in this way? Uh, it, it was just, I agree with you, Dr. Vega, it was just heartrending. Uh, to read this chapter, even after one has read it, uh, you know, several times, the same impact comes to you when I when I reread this chapter. And I think both of you have really given it the kind of depth and look at 
um, that we really kind of need to understand Du Bois the man and how he takes a kind of an individual look and, and say, black children are just as human and is worth just as much as any child in this world. They are born, they are loved, they, they die, and we grieve their loss in the same kind of way. Isn't this humanity? You know, if this is not humanity, then what is, right? Um, your second question, Dr. Vega was. Um, I am, I wonder about his audience and, and how they received that message. And if it, if it landed the way that he intended it to land just because, um, you know, my understanding is he was writing for a primarily a, a white audience. This is a persuasive, um, a persuasive text. And, and I'm wondering if he, if he was successful in, in persuading, like what our indications are of that. I don't know. Um, I was, uh, when you, you asked that question, I, I thought of Uncle Tom's Cabin and how Uncle Tom's Cabin was used as a, uh, a way to soften the heart of Northern whites to um, the process in, of enslavement, that they didn't really know what was happening in the South as far as slavery is concerned. And so that novel actually gave them a kind of a peek into the world of slavery. And so, you know, more money, uh, more support was gonna be given uh, to people at that point in time than any other. In fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, called the author of that work, the little woman who started the Civil War, uh, just by the way this is doing. And it seems to me that Du Bois is doing the same kind of thing. He's using the chapter really as propaganda, or as Marinelle Morgan would say, propaganda, uh, that um, he's using it as a kind of a wedge for those white liberals who may not know what life is like inside the veil, you know, to give a peek into that life and they could look at it. And it was, it's just like any mother and father who have their child and love their child and then lose their child. Is there a difference uh, anyway? Uh, we can see that, that there's a difference because of the kind of attention that Du Bois cannot get medical attention that Du Bois cannot get for, for his son Burkhardt. If Burkhardt had been white, the question is always asked, could he have, would he have received better care? Certainly Du Bois talks about the deep racism of Georgia uh, and then caring, not only was his son born in Great Barrington because he thought that that would be the best place for him, but they bring him back. And I think in, in the quote there, to a, a free air, he says, you know, something, he, he, he speaks of it as uh, Massachusetts as a land of freedom uh, as opposed to Georgia, which is still holding on to those things. And as Dr. Waterburn said, you know, that, you know, just before um, Burkhardt's death, you know, they had lynching, a, a horrible, horrible lynching um, that just turned Du Bois away. And he's, he's written about that as well. And so I'm sure he was thinking about that as his son is dying in, in that kind of way. So I think he thought that this would move um, uh, whites to say, oh my goodness, I didn't know that this was the way it was. And in fact, um, we still hear that same comment <laughs> in 2021, right? When we talk about black lives, uh, oh, I didn't know that that was the way it was, but one way or the other. Dr. Wedderburn, I will pass it to you. No, I, I agree. I'm over here uh, vigorously nodding my head um, because I I got the same I got the same feeling. Um, you know what might it say to us in 2021? Or um, so there are a couple of things um, that I also try to bring out in my response to in terms of the hope that um, that the boys was trying to to bring or not the hope what he hoped to achieve by writing this um, this chapter um, and where it 
where it lands in the text and so on. One of the things that struck me too is that Du Bois, like most uh, parents, have high hopes for their children. Um, and he said it. And this hope that he had was for his child's individual life, but also the hope that he could bring for Black people, for Black folk. And I think with Burkhardt's death, Du Bois grieved that as well. He mourned the loss of the hope of a pe for a people. Um, and that should not be lost on us either, right? That, um, that as, as, as Dr. Joan Sneed has said, this is a, a real human issue. We all at some point or another have to cope with death, right? Either our own or that of a loved one. And um, what else to bring to the attention of white, a white audience than this matter of death and how black folk experience death. And even more deeper or even more deeply, the how a black parent deals with the death, the loss of their child. So in a time where we are witnessing the killings and the weeping um, killings of black children, albeit adult children even, but some but young children too, teenagers, right? Um, right in front of our very eyes due to the coverage by media and the you know the prevalence of um, smartphone cameras and so on uh, it calls on us again to ask ourselves how are we really valuing each other um, how are how 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 and maybe particularly white the white audience what what does this do to you are you so callous that you this does not move you that another mother is losing their child and we are sort of just kind of casually witnessing it as another uh, spectacle on television, right? Um, and I think it also forces us to ask ourselves is, as, a, as a Black community, um, how are we dealing with these losses? Right. If nothing else, it makes us talk about this, right? Which is also something that is not easy to do. Um, so I think there may be several reasons. Um, and as has been said on this series, every time you pick up the souls of black folks, really, you, you feel something different. You find something new. It kind of tugs at you um, in a different way, sort of maybe a way you'd never seen or felt before. Um, so those are the thoughts that really came to my mind is the, the loss of the hope of a family, the loss of the hope of a people. And um, how are we really addressing that? How are we really dealing with it? How are we talking about it? And how are we um, sharing the grief um, as a community? Yes. And, and that, that's the bit that really stuck with me, um, you know, from a from a psychological perspective, um, perspective, I'm, I'm not a clinician, but I kept feeling this sense of like, he's describing intergenerational trauma, right? Like he, he is, he's described it in different ways throughout the text pointing to like the, the economic fallout of, of slavery and the social consequences of slavery. And now he's talking about the emotional consequences, right? And how it's, the it's black folks challenge not to just grieve about you know grieve with their ancestors about something that happened in the past but that grieving that trauma is still ongoing right it, it's still um something that they're dealing with every single day and so you know bringing that conversation to the the foreground and i still for me that was the call of action for the contemporary reader for the person in in 2021 is how are we talking about this loss, this this grief, this long term um, psychological impact on on a people who have you know um, lived within the veil and and can in many ways continue to right. Um, yeah, yeah um, Chris Aspie um, reminds us that Shakespeare challenged his audience: um, "Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? Organs, dimensions." senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, 
subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? You know, so um, I, I think that is really a, a, a wonderful kind of a parallel kind of look at exactly what Du Bois was talking about here in trying to describe the humanity of black souls and what that actually mean that um, indeed that uh, black people did have souls that, you know, that we were human and, and, and that we did hurt in this kind of way. Um, uh, the uh, te technical people is reminding me that uh, we are um, answering questions that have already been asked. So let me go to the questions now. Uh, hello, Marissa Massery, and welcome back uh, again. Thank you both for your comments. I am curious about the section in the chapter where Du Bois describes his son's physical appearance, mm -hmm. uh, pointing out that he had a bit of golden in his hair and some blue in his eyes. What did Du Bois mean when he said, why was his hair tinted with gold? An evil omen was golden hair in my life. Why had not the brown of his eyes crushed out and killed the blue? What point was he trying to get across here? So um, it's a really curious question. Thanks for asking that question. Um, makes you really wonder. Um, <laughs> A lot of thoughts come to mind. I'm thinking about the boy. You know, we've had issues with the boys and colorism. That's that's one thing that comes to mind. But um, to stick to this question, I think the boys did not like the appearance of um, a biracial child. The appearance of the, a biracial child. I think um, the boys and, it, and and some have written about this as well. So I don't think um, this is new. But it seems to me that, um, especially that question about why, um, let's see here, why hadn't the brown crushed out yes. the blue, right? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, why weren't his African features more prominent? Um, and I think perhaps because of the one drop rule, which says that any, uh, if, if there's one drop of black blood, any person carrying one drop of black blood um, is deemed not white. And so the appearance of mixed race signaled to Du Bois, I think, that life was not going to be good for Burkhardt. Um, in a place where anyone appearing not to be white um, means that they will have a rough future. Um, was not a good um, indication, was not a good signal for Du Bois. And the golden hair does that. And it's why I showed the, the family tree, right? Um, uh, du Bois descended from French people um, and his great grandfather was white. And Nina was uh, a biracial. Her mother was white. So the biracial features were very strong in Burkhardt, but this was not a good, it didn't give Dr. Du Bois a good feeling, right? Um, and it also indicated, um, as some have said, that it reminded um, Dr. Du Bois of the rape of African women during slavery and that his own ancestry, the Du Bois ancestry, um, was not, had not, had not evaded that, right? That, um, that perhaps somewhere um, there was that experience, that really horrific experience of um, likely um, a, a maternal ancestor. Um, having been raped in, um, in somewhere down the line. So these are the kinds of um, discomfort that I think the boys had when he noticed these features in Burkhardt and why he would have said that. He would have rathered um, that um, Burkhardt looked more black um, than this kind of mixed race 
as a, again, due to the one drop rule. Yeah, that, that was my read of it as well. Um, you know, the, the line that, that follows that um, is for Brown were his father's eyes and his father's fathers and thus the land of the color line I saw um, the line uh, fall across my my baby's face. So so he, you know, he's describing that, you know, although, you know, he's he he appears biracial, um, he won't be spared. <laughs> he won't be spared the the trauma that comes that comes with the veil. And and yeah, I had thought, you know, perhaps, you know, the 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 white features were upsetting to Du Bois because it reminds him and, and as a, a, a biracial person, I can say, I look in the mirror sometimes and I know what these features mean and, and the, the dark past that, that they come from, right? And, and so every time he looks at his child, he's not just seeing um, you know, a black child, he's not just seeing his child, he's also seeing the history um, of his family played out on these tiny features. Yeah, and uh, that, um line after the one that you read, Dr. Vega, within the veil was he born, said I, and there within shall he live, a Negro and a Negro's son. So, uh, uh, Emily Oles uh, says, um, the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe centers around several mothers losing children or having them taken away. Stowe had lost her own son as well, witnessing enslaved women losing their children in slavery. She was appealing largely to white women who might sympathize with this pain of losing a child. And it was highly successful at turning white women's opinion toward abolitionism. I wonder what Du Bois' readership would have been at this time, white or black, male or female. Hmm. Can I let you go first, Dr. John Sneed? <laughs> well, I think that we have um, indeed, as um, uh, somebody uh, noted, um, that we have already uh, kind of talked about that, that in, in, indeed, I think he was uh, appealing um, uh, to, the, to the empathy of, um, of Northern whites, especially. And, um, and I, and I could just assume that women reading this, white women reading this, um, would have had uh, a much more visceral, visceral effect on them than say white males. Um, and but I don't know the the readership of um, of the souls of black folk. You know the percentage of men versus women. Um, certainly, I know that uh, white Southerners uh, didn't like the book uh, and thought that it would. Uh, raise uh, the expectations of uh, African-Americans more. I mean, they saw the book as a threat uh, when it was published. Um, so, um, uh, but I don't know indeed, uh, and I have read some of the, um, of what white Northerners said, but um, I think that that's a, a question for Dr. Mary Nell Morgan more than me about exactly what the readership was at that point in time. It's, it's certainly something that we should look into. Dr. Wedderburn? No, I yield completely to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I, I we, as you said, we really talked ab about um, that point of empathy. Yes. Right, between um, white mothers and black mothers. Um, yeah. um, but I've not, I really have no idea about the readership. Yes. Uh, Amanda Kleintop, uh, hello. Thank you for all for sharing your ideas about this difficult chapter. Not for the first time during this community read, I was wondering about what Nina would say about the events that Du Bois described. Dr. Witterbrunn pointed out the moments in this chapter where he asked the reader to empathize with her. Do we know any more from her point of view from the historical record? Hmm, no, um, really good question. Um, no. I have, when I was doing my research for this, <laughs> I did read, and I and I now I'm sorry I'm blanking on on where it was, but um, perhaps in some of his papers, Du Bois did mention that she was forever changed after 
the death of her son and it, it put like a, a a serious strain on their on their relationship he also expressed some some guilt um about not acting sooner uh, he uh, i think he said something like you know we just didn't know enough uh, I think he was talking about being new to parenting, but also uh, to the illness of diphtheria that, you know, they had, they had kind of waited to see if it was just a cold and that he was going to get over it. And then when they realized how serious it was, um, they acted, but it, it was too late. Um, so, uh, so there was a lot of guilt there. Um, and, and he did feel a change in his relationship with his wife, but and that's all I could, I don't know, Dr. Wetterburn, if, if you found something else in your work. No, I did not. Um, I think it's interesting how um, we rely so much on the boys to speak for his wife. <laughs> um, you know, um, clearly he is the, 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 the esteemed scholar and we read a lot about him, but Interestingly enough, I had that thought as I was reading this essay, that it seemed to me that he was very careful to give her some credit, if you will, you know, pay attention to her feelings and to share that with the gentle reader um, in this essay. Um, but beyond that, I do not recall, I, I, I read, um, as you said, Dr. Vega, about the um, the, the repercussions, if you will, and what it ha you know how it affected their marriage, but um, not um, not much more than that. Um, and I just think that it perhaps again speaks to the to the time period in which this was written that you know the men were given um, all of this um, access and opportunity, and we depended on them to speak for the women in their lives. Um, other, but and which is why I made the point about the naming. I thought that was interesting that um, that he was sure to give Burghardt and Nina's pre-marriage name and his mother's, that is Du Bois's um, mother's pre-marriage name as well. So those are the things stood out to me. You know, I think it's an interesting study of gender um, in this chapter. Um, but beyond that, no, I also did not see much else. Yes, it's, it's quite interesting. Dr. Marinell Morgan, who's going to be with us for chapter 14, uh, actually uh, has done some work on uh, Nina uh, Du Bois, as well as um, Du Bois's only granddaughter, uh, Du Bois Williams. And um, <clears throat> Nina, the, you know, what we have left of Nina are some letters that she writes to Du Bois when you know, he's in New York or when he's overseas or when she's overseas with their daughter, who's the second born. Um, but we don't get a, a lot of intimacy uh, or intimate uh, feelings about exactly what Nina felt about, uh, especially about the situation with Burkhardt. Um, we, we take Du Bois' word that she was um, seriously, uh, probably depressed uh, went through the de depression because of the death of her son. And um, we can all kind of realize as mothers that um, that, that, would be, that would happen, you know? And um, he was um, not at home a whole lot. I mean, he was on the road. He was, um, you know, when he was in, with the NAACP, he was traveling and then he was giving lectures or, you know, uh, out for research kind of things. And so she ran the household. And so um, that postpartum depression that we now know so much about, you know, um, you know, maybe she had gone through that especially. We don't know. Um, and those are some of the kind of questions I think that Dr. Mary Nell Morgan Brown uh, is trying to investigate. So uh, really, um, uh, it seems that that is an area of research that we re really kind of need to uh, look at. I looked at uh, Booker D. Washington's um, uh, and Frederick Douglass's daughters and, uh, and what they said about their mothers. Uh, and it took them to write about their mothers and especially Frederick Douglass's daughter, Rosetta, wrote about um, her mother. And that's the only thing that we know about 
Douglas's wife from, from, from a kind of a feminine point of view. So it's, it's a very interesting uh, journey to kind of be on. Karen Levine asks, I find myself wondering if the death of Burkhart created a crisis of faith for Du Bois. Dr. Shively, TJ Smith, professor of New Testament at BU came to our synagogue to study the binding of Isaac, which is such a central passage for Jews. And she spoke of it not being central in African-American churches, perhaps because of the death of so many children, but for Abraham, it was a test of faith. Um, wanna, yeah. speak, wanna speak to that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, pardon my, <laughs> my lack of knowledge in Bible, but um, if I remember correctly, Isaac was sacrificed. Is that right? So Isaac would have been given up as an offering, which I think makes a distinction between um, losing the child by natural causes, if you will, um, illness in this case, right? And so the, the study of Isaac um, is an interesting one for African-Americans. I think um, perhaps it is understood a little differently um, because this notion of sacrificing your child would ring differently in the African-American community yeah. than, um, than losing the child by birth. I mean, um, even, even the boys in the end said, isn't life hard enough, Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. That um, that death would would come, you know, you you awful thing, death. Um, yeah. Don't you see how hard it is for a black man living in this country that you would even visit this atrocity upon my upon me and my family. My family. Um, and so I think the the thinking of giving up your child for death would have a a, a really different um, resonance, if you will, um, in the African. African-American community. Um, yes, Karen, Karen is saying here that Isaac was not uh, killed. It was a test um, uh, for Isaac's uh, father, you know, um, and uh, in the end, uh, God steps in and stops it, you know, and, but at least the father was willing to give up the son uh, as, a, as a kind of test. Um, I, I didn't kind of agree with, because black people had so many more children that they looked at it in a different kind of way. I, you know, I know um, that uh, each child within um, my paternal family was just precious. I had an aunt who had, had 16 children and, um, but every one of those children were precious to her in, in one way or the other. And so it was not just how many children, but you know, even a single loss mm -hmm. was, um, uh, 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 of it. Uh, and Karen says, not that they had more children, but they had more losses of children within mm -hmm. the Black kind of community. And certainly, we, I, I think that um, we take, we think that Black people are more stoic uh, 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 about grief and loss than some. Um, but that stoic nature, I think, is, is taken inside rather than an outward, sometimes an outward display of grief, mm -hmm. you know. And, and it seems to me that Nina, uh, we can look at it as a very stoic kind of thing that she, she went on and became the perfect housewife, the perfect wife and, and mother to her second child, you know, that she would not let go and went everywhere that she went, you know, uh, so uh, that's another. Um, I to say just really quickly to uh, Dr. Jones Smith about the crisis of faith. I don't think, um, I, at least I, this, that's not how I understood, um, or at least I, I didn't see that. What I saw was Du Bois's faith actually providing comfort. Yes. So, yeah. right? So he, yeah. um, he questioned the, um, the logic, if you will, of, you know, having to, to, to go through this experience, um, especially, you know, so early in life and, and you know, um, working hard, I'm, you know, achieving in my career, I'm going to be a dad. Mm -hmm. And um, next thing you know, 18 months later, that joy is taken from him. But what he says is um, he is comforted. He's consoled with knowing that the all love, mm -hmm. right? Which is yes. that um, warm embrace 
um, that Burghard has come to know comfort yes. me in this moment. So it's yes. better for me as this doting, hopeful dad to know that my child is in a better place. Yes, yes. Right? Exactly. And, and indeed, I mean, that's a very African-American or black thing, isn't it? Right. Um, uh, to, it within, through literature, we see that uh, time and time again. Um, and Karen points out that black mothers are still losing their sons um, and daughters. Uh, I would add, uh, even here in the 21st century, I mean, isn't this what Black Lives Matters, uh, the, the campaign of Black Lives Matter, isn't that what this is all about? Uh, the losing of, of Black life. And as you talked about the poor young life, not necessarily old life. Chris Ashby uh, asked the last question I think that we'll have, would the panelists talk more about the concept of within and beyond the veil for Du Bois? Take it away, Dr. Vega. <laughs> so, so yes, he, he's he's talking about you know the separation um, between you know Black Americans and America, essentially, and and the you know all of the the mechanisms, all of the structures, all of the things that separate Black Americans from America, and so to be. To be within the veil is to be a Black American who's separated from the ideals and the, you know, the um, the idealized America that, that's not available to them. Um, not really. That's my take of it. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Wedderburn, did you have anything to add to that? No, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you both. This has been um, really inspiring and enlightening and um what a difficult chapter um you know uh to have to to go through but thank you so much for coming here and presenting it to us um next week we'll have dr david lever and lewis you know the double pulitzer prize winner biographer of uh, w.e.b du bois to talk about of alexander alexander crummel and he chose that chapter especially. And so it would be very interesting to ask him why mm -hmm. he, he chose uh, specifically uh, that chapter uh, to talk to us about. But we'll look forward to that. And thank you again. Uh, please uh, stay with us as we watch a film uh, about the beautiful Berkshires and African-American life and the work of Clinton Church Restoration. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicing Rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Hello, I'm Ray Gunn, chairman of the Clinton Church Restoration Project. We are creating a nonprofit center for African American history and culture at the historic Clinton Amy Zion Church in Gray Barrington, which I attended for over 70 years. The Berkshires are rich with black history that is little known and sometimes misunderstood. For example, my ancestor, Agrippa Hull, served in the Revolutionary War and was the largest black landowner in Stockbridge. Once completed, our center will tell his story and those of W.E.B. Du Bois, Reverend Esther Dozier, and many more. Please help by donating to this historic project. We need your support. Thank you. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, in my
grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, I went to the rock to hide my face. Rock crying out, no hiding place, no hiding place down there. Gonna pitch tent on the old campground. Pitch my tent on the old campground. Gonna pitch my tent on the old campground. Give that devil another round. No hiding place down there. See, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, you went to the rock, had my face. Rock cried out, no hiding place. No hiding place down there. No hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there.